from that moment when I discovered punk, I knew there wasn't anything that I couldn't do. first two albums I bought were like uh, Hotter Than Hell by Kiss and Let There Be Rock by ACDC and I kind of I guess I liked that guitar kind of rock being at that age but um, the moment I first heard the Sex Pistols all that became completely redundant overnight. When I heard punk rock I just loved it, sang along for it, became a big strong part of my life and then I met Cameron in the pub one night and we both shared a common interest. Uh, it got me totally uh, wanted to seek out their first record, Nevermind the Bollocks. And the moment I actually purchased that album, you couldn't just walk in the shops and buy it. I actually had to place it on order and wait a couple of months. And when it finally came in, uh, I was pretty excited. And when I heard it, it was just the most, probably to this day, it's still my number one record I've ever heard. We used to input, get all their records. We used to get them from, um, well, I used to get mine from uh, Brisbane. I used to go down there and buy up records. So all you could do was listen to your records and shit and yeah, we formed our own band. I remember Richard coming in very excitedly one day saying to me he wanted to from now on be called Dirty Dick Smegma. And I basically said, well, no, mate, you've just found the name of the band. Why did I go towards punk music? Um, in the days I was struggling, anything was fair game. And I met Cameron and basically followed him into it. I think a big part of our crowd were all the people who worked at the local uh, meat works and the railways for some reason. Probably the, the Yobbos used to come and see us because uh, they liked a bit of punk rock and uh, we were the only thing to see that was punk rock in the town. We went in armed with a set list of potential song titles. It just did it. No coordination, no practice, and strangely enough, not the worst show we ever did. And I think within five seconds, having looked at the videotape since, uh, Richard must have like dislocated his farm or something. And uh, he's in agony and being carted off to accident and emergency. And we just thought that he'd got cold feet. I think we found it at the halfway point of, of the set. So we basically uh, played, I guess, for about 30, 45 minutes, completely without Richard. And then when he came back, we just did the whole set, which you've got to remember just consists of playing a bunch of noise to some song titles. We did it all again with Richard. The guy, I don't think they even fucking knew I'd left. <laughs> After he went up to the hospital to get his thumb put back, the drum throne I was sitting on collapsed and I fell over backwards and took the snare drum and floor tom with me. And everyone said, oh gee, that's good acting. It wasn't a bolt and me throne break. Well, the music was crap <laughs> because I wasn't into that sort of music at the time. Even though punk rock was happening in other places, they were the first band that I can recall being in Rockhampton. So everybody that you had spoken to said, who are these mob of dickheads? You know, what are they, what are they doing? What are they about? And um, I just think that Rocky wasn't ready for that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's a lot of attitude. Yeah, if you get the attitude right, you'll get the music right. I think that's pretty much, yeah, I, f I like that. I'll stick with that one. <laughs> Go, 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 go. 
they really wanted us to go up and play, supposedly. And, you know, kept saying, come on, but we need demo tapes. We need demo tapes. Smeg McGig in Townsville, the Mushroom Club. Remember that well. Just came up for this brainstorm of, oh, Richard, you know, because we'd played a couple of covers by Kodak Discord. So I thought, well, look, that's how we play it anyway. We'll just bung that on. And it kind of got a little bit infectious. And Richard goes, but that song's really great. Why don't you put that on there too? Yeah, right. We'll put, look, we'll make it a four song thing. So we put TV into the pub on and three songs off the Kodak Discord record. Sent it up to these geezers. Yeah, we played at a place called the Mushroom Club and it closed down very, very soon after we played that gig. And someone wrote in saying the band, like they were offended by our band for a start, and which wasn't that bad. Done worse since that, believe me. And uh, yeah, the place got closed down, which was a shame because it was a really good club. But um, maybe it was a sign there were some other bands there running them up. Maybe it just wasn't their taste. We were surely one band from fucking Rockhampton doesn't go there and closes down a club. It was just a sloppy, average, pretty ordinary kind of show. At the end of the gig, the next morning, and the money was cut up, Cameron awards me with the grand sum of $50, which didn't even pay for the motel. So I ended up going up to the hobby shop and I bought a model train with it. The main thing that I can remember about the Dirty Rotten Bastards is that they used to spit baked beans over the audience. A song called Ingredients, whereas Richard would get a catering sized tin of baked beans and he would actually sing there off the mic, read all the ingredients off the side of it. The baked bean thing was just so impressionable, you know. So, at the end of it then, uh, Richard would just then suddenly attack the first four rows or whatever, splashing baked beans around on everyone and um, getting a whole lot of angry punters. And being what they were, some of the punks would take umbrage at this and then grab the can off him and dump it on Richard's head. So Richard again looks like this sly monster with baked beans and stuff. And it was just, the mess was just, the stage was just putrid by the stage. I used to do all them things in the band because we, no one really could play very well. Cameron could play, Robbie Shitface could play a little bit. Adam did learn to play the guitar quite, quite well. Uh, Mick didn't give a fuck, he was only in it from the chicks right from day one. We'd been out putting up flyers up around town about the week before and uh, I remember uh, a cop car pulled up saying, what are you guys doing? And Mick walked up really sweet to him and said, oh, well fellas, if you're not doing anything next Saturday night, come along to this. And they drove off and this is back in the J.B. Ockie Peterson police state era. And I said, right Mick, we're lined up for a raid now. Loads of cop cars come and me and Adam the guitarist ended up getting locked up. I don't think any other members got locked up, they're too smart. And at the time, I remember being really perplexed and going, what's, what's the big deal? You've got five kids just out of their teenage years playing music, a tiny little club to maybe 50 other kids. And I could, at the time, I just thought, what's it all about? Why this heavy-handed Gestapo Nazi kind of op oppression? Why, why this... Why clamp down on this? It wasn't until years later that I actually perceived they saw us all as this threat. They must have been shitting their pants that Smegma was in Rockhampton playing and attracting people. I still find it hard to think why it had to be clamped down like that. I still, all I can, all I can figure out is they saw it as a threat. Smegma has left a legacy. Um, just the feedback I've got over the years, obviously we're talking today Yes, it has left a legacy. We'd already inspired other people to start playing music. We certainly were an influence on the Lethal Injections. We inspired a Townsville band called Noise. I think over the years we inspired lots of people. I remember meeting people in independent bands years later, you know, coming up to me and buying me beers and shaking my hand going, if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be doing this now. And I don't know if that's true or not, but you kind of appreciate in that people respected the band that much. Well, hopefully it inspired some people to get off their ass and play some fucking music. That was a great band to be an apprentice in music in. But once you finish your apprenticeship, you just want to get the hell out. And I remember that night, we, Mick and I had kind of already thought, well, we've actually achieved probably everything we need to achieve with this. And, and we'd had a sort of pact that as soon as it wasn't fun, that's when we're going to chuck it in. I can't remember it anymore, but obviously we weren't getting on. I, don't, I really fucking couldn't tell you. 
but obviously we weren't getting on. Cameron turned up at my house one night. Um, we had a jam. Woke up the next morning, beer cans everywhere. We basically did covers of Husker Do, Sex Pistols, The Cure, um, stuff like that. I've known Cameron for... a long time. <laughs> I got the name Captain Carl Chaos from Cameron, actually. Um, he just came out with it one day. We're sitting in the Savoy. The Savoy uh, wasn't the flashiest of pubs. The Savoy. Yeah, I saw him, I saw the primary play at the Savoy, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was cool as well. It was a bit different. They'd sort of taken on a bit of a... Um, I suppose it was a bit songier, you know. The boss decided that um, it wasn't his cup of tea and asked what he thought would get them off stage. And I said, well, you would try beer. There was something going on or something where if the management had basically said ply these guys with beers to make them stop playing. They took that, they were pretty happy with that payment to um, drink a keg of beer instead of playing all night. And I think they proceeded actually to get paid in alcohol for quite a while <laughs> after that, basically not to play. We were actually given VIP treatment for every other bar in town and were loaded up with free drinks till dawn. I mean, it was yeah, pretty incredible times. It was, it was good. I think a really positive thing about that band was um, we got people out of the woodwork and, and we had this little community feel going on, hey, and it was really positive. Even though they were entertainingly bad, um, <laughs> their makeup was worse. <laughs> We decided to form the dog chairs, except the dog chairs were going to be way better. We were going to be, you know, tighter and faster and louder and just really more committed than like any of our previous bands had been. But the dog chairs, I mean, they did do quite a lot of gigs around Brisbane and they were quite, they were known, you know, and they had a bit of a reputation. But I heard a lot of good things and, uh, you know, apparently they could make quite a racket. <laughs> I mean, Dog Chairs was a completely different kettle of fish to Smegma for a start. We actually played really well. We played really fast and really tight and really well. And we wrote good songs. And we had melody in there among the furiousness. They were a pretty good band. They're pretty raucous, but they were a whole step up the ladder from Smegma. Like they were a whole lot more organised and sort of, they could actually all play a song together, which was quite an achievement. For once, Rocky could feel pretty comfy knowing it had produced a regional independent band that could stack up against anyone, basically. Which was good, you know, it's just wholehearted sort of punk rock, you know, uh, hardcore sort of stuff. Um, which I, you know, I can appreciate. They're great players and, yeah, I like it. There's a sort of a code, and then, you know, they were, they were good. It's ironic, we were better musicians in dog chairs, but I think Smegma had more of even the musical legacy because it was just so strikingly different and original. Uh, partly due to the fact <laughs> the band couldn't really play. <laughs> So I was cruising across the bridge and there was this guy wearing a Public Image Limited shirt that he'd made himself. And it was Cameron. And I didn't know at this stage. And I gave him a big wave and stuff. And I went to work. And five minutes later, he was in at work. And within 10 minutes, we realised it all moulded in together. And uh, yeah, I've known Cameron since then. So. But it was actually Cameron who got the, the ball sort of rolling for me as to playing in bands and stuff like that. Like previously, growing up as a young fella, I had guitar lessons and things like that, but um, pushing the whole band structure was uh, from Cameron actually, which I'm really grateful to him for. My then band Mildred was on. Now this is the first band I've actually played guitar for. 
up to this point have played bass in all these bands. So I'm sort of like, I picked up a guitar because I was writing songs that no one else could interpret. I think we were, everything was just into this, everything had one name, we just wanted it to be a name, but that didn't really mean anything. And so we thought Mildred for George and Mildred, I believe. <laughs> I said it could be fucking wrong. <laughs> Mildred was a sloth of a band. It was, it had the slowest, slowest sluggish, sluggish rhythm section you'd ever hear in your life. Like a sloth, just this, this thing just going along at some slow, slothful pace. Mildred started and it was anything but a punk rock band. It was, I don't know what you'd call it. It was Mildred. There you go. And most of the songs were, up to that point, nearly every band I played in, songs were under one minute or under two minutes. And this band's songs would be anything from 8 to 14 to 16 minutes. Yeah, I've always got a special time for Cameron, always. Yeah, so he got me started. I don't know if he thought that he'd create such a monster when he did, but he did. It's your fault, Cameron. <laughs> It was just the most shit canning review I've ever read in my life, which I'm so proud of. I think he said, if the drummer had kept his mouth away from the goon bag long enough, you know, they might have sounded half decent or something. It was a fucking shambles, eh, the second one. The first one went all right, I think, anyway. Good time, good gig. I managed to finish that cask of goon. It's the bad review that money can't buy. It's lovely. And this guy not only said that we give people headaches instead of their money back and we were migraine inducing and et cetera, et cetera. It was just marvellous stuff. And then went on to say that not only he hoped we'd never play again, but we'd single-handedly doomed the future of independent music in Rockhampton and independent music in Rockhampton would ever be screwed up because of us. That's just priceless, isn't it? <laughs> Cameron is the most happiest, bubbly man I think I've ever met. G'day, Bryce, how you going? And he's just got that bloody, yeah, he's got that little thing about him that, that can light up a room, yeah. Cameron and I started with the band, we started, as I say, we started as Spice Boys, um, first, my first inning into a band. We had um, Wazer on drums and he'd improved by this stage as well and he's, you know, he's doing fills and rolls and Mark's this very solid bass player, uh, not big on you know, technical stuff. Well, it's just probably everyone starts with bass, you know. Bit of the Ramones sort of thing that's three chords, you, you know, pluck it out. And So, as I say, I wasn't any genius, <laughs> you know. It's pretty bad, actually. And the Spice Boys thing, well, obviously, you put it in the context of the time, 97 was the year the Spice Girls went ballistic. So we just thought it was a complete piss take. I think it might have been Angela came up with, why don't you call yourself the Spice Boys? Nice for us. It was funny. I mean, I don't know if it's still bloody funny. But the weird thing was, whenever we'd put it up on flyers, you'd have things like, you know, better pro crusty, spit of hate, Spice Boys. I was sitting there thinking, no, we're going to be rock stars. You know, I'm going to have girls, lots of girls, you know, and we're going to be playing in big venues and... But it didn't happen like that. The, the Spice Boys gig we played down at Bonkers in Yapoon there, and I must be the only drummer I know in the world who actually takes just two drumsticks to a gig. Come bonkers though, yes, the fun started. There's that bonkers show, I'd really have to talk about that. After the smoke machine started up and the salmon started flashing all the little lights around us and I couldn't see my strings, I couldn't see anything. Warren lost his drumsticks and we just, oh, no. They load up the smoke so you can't even see what chords you're playing which didn't bother me because I knew these songs like the back of my hand anyway. Suddenly the drums just cut out. I'm going, well, whatever. And I look around, he's got one stick, he's lost the stick. Right, okay. Drums cut out completely, like nothing. Oh, okay, still playing. Guitar and bass. Bass cuts out. Right, and I look across this foggy, smoky kind of stage thing going on, and there we've got these guys on all fours, like playing cats and dogs, crawling around on the stage in all this dry ice trying to find the missing drumsticks. It was pretty hilarious. I, just, I think I just made some crack and kind of like cracked a tolly I had there and just had a laugh and sat there drinking beer laughing at it. I mean, what, what else can you do? That was probably the end of the Spice Boys. Ow! 
I remember reading letters from this guy, Bad Board Borgie Bollocks in Rockhampton. I was just astounded that there was somebody in Rockhampton that was like that. And I just wanted to meet that guy. Basically, we were this really strange Australian version then, completely unintentionally, of Bikini Kill in a way. We're all big sort of Bikini Kill fans. We love the whole Riot girl scene. So we'd throw in a few, few names out there and Hamster Baby was the one that stuck for us. The band, you get photos of Bikini Kill uh, from that period and you put them with a photo of us guys and you've got this strange, bizarro Australian version of the band. Super sweet guy. I was just like, wow, this is such a nice guy and he was so full on. But what we did have was a fair bit of passion for what we're doing. We've just shared a, a love for, for music, from record shopping, shopping to singles night, pulling out the seven inches and drinking and listening to lots of great music. Luckily, again, with the you know, great contact of Johnny, he set, set us up for some free recording time if we could get the Brisbane. Started off with, we hadn't even gotten half a mile from Cameron's place and it just, the whole car just exploded in a huge argument and with me telling our bass player Rebecca to get the fuck out of my car. Oh, it's the longest recording process I've ever been involved in my life. So just in case, don't take over anything we've previously yeah. done, okay? What do you mean don't take over anything you've previously done? You already take over everything we previously do, don't you? Of course you do. Well, how much tape do you think we got in? <laughs> Not very much. The whole tape only runs for 25 minutes. $150. Cameron, Cameron is always always the, the peacekeeper and so he sort of like calmed everything down but there was that divide between the young kids which was Lauren and Rebecca. Rebecca me, being the main instigator of the of the crap and um, myself and Cameron they called us the old people. But we managed to get three songs down which the results were really good well I thought they were. Um, certainly Lauren thought they were. I think Becky was a bit iffy and I know Leslie absolutely hated it. The recording session was a, a little bit of a volatile um, time for us, a little bit of a crazy weekend. Anyway we get back to Rockhampton and within the space of about a month there's some sort of inner band politics turmoil going on. The trip down was just nothing but bitching back and forth between us and the trip back was bitching back and forth between us and, and the studio was bitching back and forth. <laughs> It was just a major bitch fest, so... It got to the stage where Liz Lear had left the band and Rebecca had left and it was down to just Lauren and myself. We really wanted to do an album because we'd rehearsed all these songs quite hard. So Lauren and I decided to finish the album off on four track, which in a way is a kind of, kind of right girl kind of punk thing to do anyway. No, we never played live. The band never played live in Rocky, Brisbane or anywhere. Um, we never really got past the recording phase. I think I had the final mix of the tape ready about the day before Lauren died. So obviously with Lauren's death, uh, I, I just, you know, left my job here in Rockhampton and went down and worked in Brisbane, met a new group of mates for a couple of years and stuff and just uh, had to let that go. I've since sat down and listened to the Hamster Baby recordings and I've got to admit my opinion has mellowed somewhat over the years and I look back at it quite fondly now. It, it was good fun, you know, it was nothing like a good scrap. <laughs> the fairest one of all, pretty, 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 pretty girls in the mall. Get a life before you lose your, get a life before you lose your, get a life before you lose your life. I also used to play some solo shows when the clergy first started playing live, uh, also at their party, sometimes do a solo set at Johnny's legendary parties. Came, came back from Brisbane, full of confidence, and he's just like, played his show. He was, he'd already organised this thing, and uh, he was playing a set. And he said, oh, you know. And we were always balking, saying, oh, we don't have a drum, we don't have this, you know, sort of nervous, and find, finding reasons not to play, you know, sort of just a bit out of confidence. And he's like, oh, I'll, I'll drum, you know. How hard can it be, you know, I can drum. <laughs> But I do remember actually volunteering my services as a drummer, being the one instrument that I knew nothing about. He just rocked up, he, no drumsticks, he had, no one had sticks, so it was just like, he had a ruler and a, like a kick drum beater, you know, and it, that was it. It's just, here I am, you know, <laughs> you want the drummer, you got it. 
<laughs> the very first solo record I did, I actually covered the entire Beatles White Album. And I remember buying a slab of EB, chucking it in the deep freeze, putting a little cassette recorder with a re one touch record button on it, stick the old bass man valve amp there, distortion pedal, bass guitar. That was it, you know, him doing the White Album on cassette live. <laughs> You know, well, that's something. And just with the occasional hit in the pause button to open the freezer and pull out some cold VBs, that was it. It's awesome. Who would even, whose dream is that? We were just here like going, no way, <laughs> fuck. It's not possible. Who, what is that? It's fantastic. I remember doing acoustic shows up at Mount Morgan and places like that, all these really non-rock and roll kind of environments, pretty horrible sort of shows too, you know, you kind of get home feeling rather depressed that you've played to these totally uncaring, really lousy audiences. I do this annual thing at the Village Arts Festival where I generally play a solo set. Uh, it was really gracious of those guys to give me a, a chance at it, and, you know, it's been just getting bit better every year and I remember the first year I just played basically a set of acoustic mix of originals and covers and it was just on the big stage acoustic. The second year I was back on the big stage with uh, an electric set, really really quite brutal loud noisy fast punky set. The third year uh, DC were in operations so instead of doing a solo set I actually played the show with Danny as DC and we played Headline the chi Town that night that was just fantastic. The smaller stage was more immediate, the better time slot, we had a, you know, a full appreciative crowd of kids and then went back to an acoustic set and played you know, a bit of a Bob Dylan songbook kind of thing, yeah, which was good fun too. Time. Don't think twice, it's alright. 